Hi friends, I'm Max Locato. Did you know that the Bible makes more than 100 references to the Holy Spirit? Jesus says more about this counselor than he does about the church, marriage, finances, and the future. In my new book, Help Is Here, we'll take a deep dive into who the Holy Spirit is and how to access the joy, power, peace, and purpose he offers. Be encouraged. Help is here. Available now at maxlucato.com. Hi, everybody. Max Lucato here from my home to yours. Thanks so much for joining me for today's encouraging word. May the Lord's richest blessings be with you. May you be reminded, may you be reminded that your heavenly Father loves you. You need the reminder. I need the reminder. We need the reminder that we have a a miracle working God who is always present with us, always present with us. But we need that reminder today. We need to know that we're never alone, especially in these days of hostility and anxiety. I wonder if you could imagine for just a moment Imagine yourself in Jesus' situation, in the final moments, his final moments with his disciples. Imagine that it's your final hour with those you love, your final hour with the Son about to be sent overseas, your last moments with your dying friend, a one final visit with your parent. What do you do? What do you say? How do you respond in such a situation? Well, my Bible is open to the to the Gospel of John, and we find an answer in John 17 of how Jesus spent his final moments with his followers. He chose to pray for them, and he chose to pray for us. I pray for these men, but I'm also praying for all people who will believe in me because of the teaching of these men. Father, Jesus said, I pray that all people who believe in me can be one. And I pray that these people can also be one in us so that the world will know that you sent me. John chapter 17, verses 20 and 21. You need to note, my friend, that in this final prayer, this final prayer that Christ offered, Christ prayed for you. You need to underline in red, and highlight in yellow his love. I am also praying, he said, for all people, all people who will believe in me because of the teaching. Friend, that's you. That's you. As Jesus stepped into the Garden of Gethsemane to continue his prayer, you were in his prayers. As Jesus looked into heaven for strength, he he could see you in his vision. As Jesus dreamed that the day that we will all be where he is, he saw you there. He envisioned you there. He imagined you there. His final prayer was about you. His final pain was for you. His final passion, well, his final passion was you. He then turns and he he steps into the garden and he invites Peter and James and John. You know the story. He invites them to come and, and pray with them. He tells them that his soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. And he begins to pray. Never has he felt so alone. What must be done? What must be done? Whatever it is, only he can do it. An angel can't do it. <clears throat> no angel has the power to, to break open hell's gates. Uh, a person can't do it. No man or woman has the purity to destroy sin's claim. No force on earth can face the force of evil and win except God. Except God. And God in the flesh acknowledges the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He confesses that in Matthew 26 and verse 41. His humanity begged to be delivered from what his divinity knew was about to happen. Jesus, the carpenter, implores. Jesus, the man, peers into the dark pit and begs. 
Can't there be a, another plan? Can't there be another option? I wonder if he knew the answer before he asked the question. And I wonder if his, his human heart hoped his heavenly father had found another way. We don't know. I don't know. But we do know this. We do know this. He asked to get out. We do know he, he begged for an exit. We do know there was a time when if he could have, he would have turned his back on the whole mess and gone away. But he couldn't. He couldn't. He couldn't because he saw you. He saw us right there in the, in the middle of a world gone crazy, right there in the middle of a world that isn't fair. He saw you cast into a river of life that you didn't request. He saw you. He saw you be betrayed by those you love. He saw you with a, with a body that gets sick and a heart that grows weak. He, he saw you, my friend. He saw you in your own version of the Garden of Gethsemane with gnarled trees and sleeping friends. He saw you staring into the pit of your own failures, the mouth of your own grave. He saw you. He saw your Garden of Gethsemane. And friend, he didn't want you to be alone. He didn't. He wanted you to know that he has been there too. He knows what it's like to be plotted against. He, he knows what it's like to be betrayed. He, he knows what it's like to be torn between two desires. He knows. He knows what it's like to, to smell the stench of Satan. And perhaps most of all, he knows what it's like to, to beg God to change his mind and to hear God say so gently but firmly, no. For that's what God said to Jesus, and Jesus accepted the answer. And at some moment during that fateful night, during that midnight hour, an angel of, of mercy came over the weary Savior, the weary body of the man in the garden. And as he stood, the anguish was gone from his eyes. His fist would clench no more. His heart would fight no more. And the battle was won. You may have thought it was won on Golgotha. It wasn't. You may have thought the sign of victory was the empty tomb. Well, it wasn't the first one. The final battle was won in the Garden of Gethsemane. And the sign of conquest was Jesus at peace in the olive trees. For it was, it was in the garden that Jesus made his decision, that he prayed for you. Pay close attention to this, friend. You're never without hope. You're never without help because Jesus would rather go to hell for you than go to heaven without you. You, my friend, are never, ever alone. Hey, this is Dina Lynn Lakato. Max and I are so thankful you joined us for today's Encouraging Word and the You Are Never Alone series. Please subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss a single message. And give us a rating. We love hearing from you. For more information on Max's ministry, books, and resources, visit maxlucato.com. Until next time, stay encouraged. Susan here with Team Lucado. We're excited to announce a fresh take on Max's best-selling 365-day devotional, Grace for the Moment Note-Taking Edition. Each page of this beautiful leather soft edition has plenty of room to pen your own prayers and insights. 
you can order your copy of Grace for the Moment Note-Taking Edition now at maxlocato.com. Hi friends, I'm Max Locato. Did you know that the Bible makes more than 100 references to the Holy Spirit? Jesus says more about this counselor than he does about the church, marriage, finances, and the future. In my new book, Help Is Here, we'll take a deep dive into who the Holy Spirit is and how to access the joy, power, peace, and purpose he offers. Be encouraged. Help is here. Available now at MaxLucato.com. Hi, everybody. Max Lucato here from my home to yours. Thanks so much for joining me for today's Encouraging Word. May God give you strength. I believe that John's gospel is all about urging us to believe in God's presence and power, no matter what storm we're going through. Now, you may be going through a storm right now. I'd like to take a minute and share a story with you about a storm, a storm that I'll never forget, but a storm in the midst of which God met me. God met me. I was young. I was young. I was old enough for baseball. I was old enough for football. I was old enough for bike riding, but I was not old enough to process what came my way that, that weekend. Sexual molestation at the hands of an adult man. He entered my world under the guise of a, of a mentor. He befriended several of us, several families, in fact, in our small town. I remember him as witty, I remember him as charming. I remember him as generous. What I did not know, what no one knew, is that he had an eye for young boys. He would have us over to his house for burgers. He would take us on rides in his uh, pickup truck. He, He took us fishing. He took us hunting. He took us hiking. He offered to answer all the questions that that boys have about life and love and girls. He owned owned magazines, the kind that my father did not permit. And he would do and did things that I'm not going to repeat, but I'll never forget. On a particularly perverse weekend, he took us on a camp out. He loaded five of us in his truck, in his pickup camper, and he drove to a campground among, among his pack of tents and sleeping bags were, were a few bottles of whiskey. And he drank his way through the weekend and worked his way through the sleeping bags of each boy. Now, he told us not to tell our parents, implying that we were to blame for his sordid behavior. By swearing us to secrecy, he said, well, I'm just, I'm just keeping you from getting into trouble. As if we were to blame. What a scoundrel. What a scoundrel. I came home on Sunday afternoon feeling filthy and shame-ridden. I had missed a communion service that Sunday morning at church. And if ever I needed, if ever I needed communion, It was that day. So you know what I did? I staged my own communion service, my own Eucharist. I waited until mom and dad went to bed. I didn't tell them what had happened. I went into the kitchen. I couldn't find any crackers, but I found some potatoes from the Sunday lunch. I couldn't find any grape juice, and my parents didn't drink wine, but I used milk. I placed the potatoes uh, on a saucer, and I placed the, of course, poured the milk in a, in a glass, and I celebrated the crucifixion of Christ, and I celebrated the salvation, the redemption of my soul. 
what the sacrament lacked in liturgy was made up for in tenderness. Jesus met me in that moment. I sensed him. I sensed him. He healed me. He healed me. He came, his love, his presence. It was right there. I, I, don't press me. I don't know exactly how I knew, but I just knew Jesus, Jesus was present in my storm. He was present in the storm for the disciples too. Do you remember how their boat was in the middle of the sea? How the scripture says it was tossed about by the waves because the wind was contrary. That's the description Matthew gives in chapter 14. Peter and his friends knew they were in trouble. Winds whipped the sails of the boat, leaving the disciples in the middle of the sea, in the middle of the sea, tossed about by the waves. That's an accurate description for many people today. Maybe your life. Perhaps all we need to do is, is substitute a few of the nouns in the middle of a divorce tossed about by guilt, in the middle of bankruptcy or debt tossed about by creditors and anxiety, in the middle of the pandemic tossed about by insomnia and worry. Storms come, don't they? The disciples fought the storm. You might remember this. Nine cold, skin-drenching hours they fought the storm. At about 4 a.m., the unspeakable happened. They spotted someone coming. They spotted someone coming on the water. They, they said, a ghost, a ghost. They cried out in terror. But they, didn't, they didn't expect Jesus to come to them this way. Jesus replied to the disciples, fear with, a, with an invitation worthy of inscription on every church, every cornerstone, every residential archway. He said, it's all right. I am here. Don't be afraid. Now, friend, power inhabits those words. You know, to awaken in an ICU and hear your husband say, I'm here. To lose your retirement, yet feel the support of your, of your family. We are here, they tell you. Or when a little leaguer spots mom and dad up in the stands, and he knows they're watching and can hear them say, we're here. Well, I am here changes everything, doesn't it? Perhaps that's why God repeats the I am here pledge so often. Do you know the scripture? The Lord is near, Philippians 2, 5. You are in me and I am in you, John 14 and verse 20. I am with you always, always, always to the end of the age, Jesus promised, Matthew 28 and verse 20. I give them eternal life, Jesus said, and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. No one, John 10 and verse 28. Nothing can ever separate us. Nothing can ever separate us from his love. Death can't. Life can't. The angels can't. The demons can't. Our fears for today, our worries about tomorrow, even, even the powers of hell can't keep God's love away. That's Romans chapter 8. Hmm. We cannot go where God is not, friend. We cannot. Look over your shoulder. That's God following you. Look into the storm. That's Christ coming in your direction. He's still the great I am. When we find ourselves in the middle of a storm, in the middle of a Galilean storm, with no shore in sight, He will come. He will come to us. And if you need to dive into that message more deeply, I pray that you will. I pray that you will. Trust that Christ is with you, that he's with you. If you can sense him, wonderful. If you cannot, that's okay. That's okay. He has said he'll never leave you. And my friend, that is a promise that he intends to keep. God bless you. Hey, this is Dina and Lakato. Max and I are so thankful you joined us for today's encouraging word. 
in the You Are Never Alone series. Please subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss a single message and give us a rating. We love hearing from you. For more information on Max's ministry, books, and resources, visit maxlucato.com. Until next time, stay encouraged. Hello, friends. Susan here with Team Lucato. We're excited to announce a fresh take on Max's best-selling 365-day devotional, Grace for the Moment, Note-Taking Edition. Each page of this beautiful leather-soft edition has plenty of room to pen your own prayers and insights. You can order your copy of Grace for the Moment, Note-Taking Edition now at maxlocato.com. Hi friends, I'm Max Lucado. Did you know that the Bible makes more than 100 references to the Holy Spirit? Jesus says more about this counselor than he does about the church, marriage, finances, and the future. In my new book, Help Is Here, we'll take a deep dive into who the Holy Spirit is and how to access the joy, power, peace, and purpose he offers. Be encouraged. Help is here. Available now at maxlucato.com. Hi, everybody. Max Lucato here from my home to yours. Thanks so much for joining me for today's encouraging word. Friend, may God bless you. May God bless you. I imagine you're facing some difficult circumstances. I imagine you're facing some challenges. And I imagine that you, along with all of us, need a reminder that we're never alone, never alone. That's what I talk about in this new book that we're talking about these days. We're talking about the miracle of God's presence and power. And boy, don't you, don't we need it? Don't we need it? Here's what Jesus said. Jesus said, therefore, I tell you, stop being perpetually uneasy, anxious, and worried about your life. That's the Amplified Bible's translation of Matthew 6, 25. Nowhere does Jesus condemn legitimate concern for responsibilities, but he does caution against this continuous mindset that dismisses God's presence, destructive anxiety, we could call it. And this destructive anxiety dismisses God from the future. It tallies up the challenges without calculating God, without entering God into the equation. Worry worry is the dark room where negatives become glossy prints. My friend saw an example of perpetual uneasiness and anxiety in his six-year-old daughter, of all people. In her hurry to dress for school, she tied her shoelaces in a knot. She plopped down at the base of the stairs and began trying to disentangle the knot. She fixated her thoughts on that tangled mess. The school bus was coming. The minutes were ticking, and she was increasingly frustrated. She gave no thought to the fact that her father was standing next to her nearby, and he was willing to help. Upon her request, her little hands began to shake. Her tears began to drop. Finally, in an expression of total frustration, she she dropped her forehead to her knees and she began to cry. Now, that's really a child-sized portrait of destructive anxiety. It's a, it's a not fixation to the point of anger and exasperation, oblivious to the presence of of our Father, our Heavenly Father, who stands right next to us. We're never alone. My friend finally took it upon himself to to come to his daughter's aid, and our Heavenly Father comes to ours. I wonder, why didn't she ask for his help? Why didn't she ask for his help to start with? We could ask the same question of the disciples 
Uh, they were just one request away from some help that they sorely needed. The hungry crowd appeared at an inopportune time. Jesus' heart was heavied by the news of the death of, of the murder of John the Baptist. So he took the disciples on a, on a getaway, on a retreat. He said, come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest. Uh, they, they intended to get away, but droves of people, maybe 15 or even 20,000 people followed them. A multitude of people who wanted help. And they were really a multitude of sickness. And they didn't bring anything but their needs. And Jesus treated them. He treated the people. He treated them with healing. He treated them with kindness. Now, the disciples, they didn't share his compassion. The scripture says that evening, the disciples came to him and they said, this is a remote place. And it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy food for themselves. That's Matthew's gospel there. Boy, that's, the disciples sound a bit testy, don't you think? I, I, the followers typically preface their comments to Jesus with the respectful Lord or, or Master. Not this time. Not this time. Anxiety does that to us. It, it makes tyrants out of us. And they issued a command to Christ, not a request. They said, send them away. Send them home so they can buy food for themselves. Again, worry, worry turns us into bossy people. Just like the disciples are saying, don't you think we can, you think we can feed all these people by ourselves? They didn't have, we don't have resources for such a mob. Now, their disrespect did not perturb Jesus. He just gave them an assignment. He said, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. That's in verse 16. I'm imagining a few shoulder shrugs, and maybe some rolled eyes, maybe the disciples huddling and grumbling, finally tallying up their supplies. Peter likely led the discussion with a bark. All right, let's count and see what we got. We got some bread. We got some fish. All right. One, two, three, four, five. I got five loaves. Andrew, you count, you, you count the and check and see if I counted right. And so Andrew does one, two, three, four, five. Okay, five loaves. Peter set aside the bread and inquired about the fish. Same routine, lower number. Fish, let me see. Well, there's one, there's two, there's three. Oh, change that. I miscounted. There's, I counted one fish twice. Looks like the grand total of fish is two, just two. The aggregate was declared. In the scripture, they say to Jesus, we have only five loaves and two fish. That descriptor only stands out in verse 17, as if to say our resources are hopelessly puny. There's nothing left. There's nothing left but this wimpy lunch. The fuel needle was on empty. The clock was, was on the last hour. The knot could not be disentangled. Philip, if you remember, he adds a personal audit. He says eight months wages could not buy enough bread for each one to have a single bite. John 6 and verse 7. Oh, my goodness. The, it's as if the disciples are saying, this assignment is too great for us. Now, how do you suppose Jesus felt about this basket inventory? Any chance, any chance he might have wanted them to include the rest of the possibilities, involve all of the options? Any chance do you think he was hoping that somebody might count to eight well, let's see, Jesus, we have uh, five loaves, two fish, and we have you. We have you. We have you, Jesus, the Jesus who told us, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. We have you, Jesus. We, we have five loaves, two fish, and you. You're the one who told us, if you remain in me and, and my words remain in you, you ask whatever you wish, and it will be given to you. We have five loaves, we have two fish, and we have you. <laughs> and you're the one who said, whatever you ask for in prayer, just believe that you've received it. 
and it will be yours. It will be given to you. You see, standing right next to the disciples was the solution to their problems. But they didn't go to him. They stopped their count at seven and they worried. Friend, what about you? Are you counting to seven? Or are you counting to eight? When you feel overwhelmed by the challenges of your life today, count Jesus in. Count on him. And remember, you're in good hands. Folks, we've got to keep this in mind in these difficult, difficult days. Jesus is with us, and he will help us disentangle these knots. And be reminded, my friend, you are never, ever alone. Hey, this is Dina and Lakato. Max and I are so thankful you joined us for today's Encouraging Word and the You Are Never Alone series. Please subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss a single message. And give us a rating. We love hearing from you. For more information on Max's ministry, books, and resources, visit maxlucato.com. Until next time, stay encouraged. Susan here with Team Locato. We're excited to announce a fresh take on Max's best-selling 365-day devotional, Grace for the Moment, Note-Taking Edition. Each page of this beautiful leather-soft edition has plenty of room to pen your own prayers and insights. You can order your copy of Grace for the Moment, Note-Taking Edition now at maxlocato.com. Hi friends, I'm Max Locato. Did you know that the Bible makes more than 100 references to the Holy Spirit? Jesus says more about this counselor than he does about the church, marriage, finances, and the future. In my new book, Help Is Here, we'll take a deep dive into who the Holy Spirit is and how to access the joy, power, peace, and purpose he offers. Be encouraged. Help is here. Available now at MaxLucato.com. Hi, everybody. Max Lucato here from my home to yours. Thanks so much for joining me for today's Encouraging Word. How is your 2020 going? Isn't it interesting that this year of great confusion and distortion and challenge is marked by the numbers 2020, that phrase we use to describe perfect vision. Doesn't seem like many of us are seeing our way clear. And yet our Heavenly Father will help us. In fact, there's a story in the Bible of Jesus helping someone who could not see at all and granting them the ability to see. And what God did for that person physically, He will do for all of us spiritually, and many of us physically. Oh, the great miracle of the gift of sight. John chapter 9. John chapter 9. My Bible is open to John chapter 9. By the way, I tell this story in my new book, You Are Never Alone. As Jesus passed by, He saw a man blind from birth. John chapter 9 and verse 1. This man has never seen a sunrise. Can't tell purple from pink. The disciples fault the family tree. Their question is, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? Neither is the response of Jesus. Neither. He goes on to say that the reason the man was born blind born sightless, was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Well, the cure proves to be as curious and surprising as the cause. Jesus spat on the ground 
and he made clay of the spittle and he applied the clay to the man's eyes. That's in verse six. You know, the world abounds with paintings of Jesus. Jesus in the arms of Mary. <clears throat> Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane. Jesus in the upper room. Jesus in the darkened tomb. Jesus touching. Uh, Jesus weeping. Jesus laughing. Jesus teaching. But I don't think I've ever seen a painting of Jesus spitting. Have you? Christ smacking his lips a time, time or two, gathering a mouthful of saliva, working up a, a blob of, of, of drool and, and letting it go down in the dirt. And then he squats and he stirs up a puddle of, I don't know, what do we call this? Holy putty? Spit therapy? Saliva solution? Whatever the name, he places a finger full in his palm, and then as calmly as a painter spackles a hole in the wall, Jesus streaks mud miracle on the blind man's eyes. And he says this, Now go and wash in the pool of Siloam, verse 7. What well, the beggar does, he feels his way to the pool. He splashes water on his mud-streaked face. And he rubs away the clay. And the result is the, well, it's his own personal version of the first chapter of Genesis. Light where there was darkness. His virgin eyes focus, fuzzy figures become human beings. And the man came back seeing. He came back seeing. Oh, the guy had to be thrilled. Later on in the story, toward the end of the story, in fact, he says, one thing I know, I was blind, but now I see. Christians talk like this. We too reflect upon the joy of sudden sight. We love to sing the words to the old hymn, Amazing Grace. Do you recall? Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. What's next? I once was lost. But now I'm found, I was blind, but now I see. Blind, blind to the purpose of life, blind to the promise of eternal life, blind to the provider of life. But now, now our sight is restored. We relate to the words of the was blind beggar. In fact, his story is our story. Perhaps that's why John was in no hurry to tell it. This miracle takes him forever to describe. Up until now, he's been the chief of conciseness. He used only 12 verses to describe how water became wine, the healing at the pool of Bethesda. That only required 15 verses with 14 scriptures. Uh, the crowd was fed and with only six the Savior walked on water. But when John placed pen to papyrus to describe the story of the blind man given sight, the apostle took his time. He dedicated a whopping 41 verses to depicting how Jesus found, cured, and matured the man. Now, why? Why the emphasis? Well, among the explanations must be this one. What Jesus did physically for the blind beggar, he desires to do spiritually for all people. He desires to restore our sight. You see, from heaven's viewpoint, our earth is populated by sightless people, blinded by ambition, blinded by pride, Blinded by success. The scripture says, seeing, they do not see. Matthew 13, 13. They do not see. They do not see the meaning of life. They do not see the, the love of God. Folks, how else do we explain the confusion and the chaos of this world? How else? How else do we explain the, the constant threat of world war? the plagues of hunger, 
and the holocaust of the unborn. How else do we explain the bitterness, the anger? How else do we explain the rising rate of suicide and drug addiction? Folks, we have faster planes than ever, faster phones than ever. We have artificial intelligence. Yet we're killing each other with guns and killing ourselves with opioids. Billions of people simply cannot see. The Apostle Paul said, The devil who rules this world has blinded the minds of those who do not believe. They cannot see, they cannot see the good news. The good news about the glory of Christ, who is exactly like God. That's in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4. We need a spiritual ophthalmologist, do we not? We need Jesus to do for all of us what he did for the man on the side of the Jerusalem road. You know, if, if, if God tested your spiritual vision, would you pass it? Can you see? Can you see him? Can you see the meaning of life? Have you caught a vision for eternity? Most of all, can you see God's great, unlimited love for you. Friend, the hand on your face today is His. The voice you hear today is His. It's not His will that you grope blindly through life. He wants you to know why you are on this earth. He wants you to know where you are going. Your vision matters to Jesus, and He will do whatever it takes, even spit therapy, to show us how to see If you're in need of sight, if you feel like your world is dark, turn to Jesus today. Turn to Him. Ask Him. Ask Him to touch your eyes, to give you spiritual sight, and to take this craziness of 2020 and to give you vision for who He wants you to be and where He is taking you. God bless you, my friend. Hey, this is Dina Lynn Lakato. Max and I are so thankful you joined us for today's encouraging word in the You Are Never Alone series. Please subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss a single message and give us a rating. We love hearing from you. For more information on Max's ministry, books, and resources, visit maxlucato.com. Until next time, stay encouraged. Susan here with Team Locato. We're excited to announce a fresh take on Max's best-selling 365-day devotional, Grace for the Moment Note-Taking Edition. Each page of this beautiful leather soft edition has plenty of room to pen your own prayers and insights. You can order your copy of Grace for the Moment Note-Taking Edition now at maxlocato.com.